thank, thank you, thank you very much. Can you, if you can't hear at the back, will you say? Because otherwise it's very dispiriting to get to the end and then people tell you at the end and <laughs> you pretend to feel upset, but actually you slightly want to hear them as well. So it's, it's confusing. So um, people often do that thing of saying someone needs no introduction and then introducing them. I'm not going to do that with George because you all know who he is and why we're here. And we're here to talk about how we got into this mess. And so the qu first question is, is, is how, how would you characterise the mess? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think at root, we have a clash of two defunct economic frameworks, neither of which can deliver um, for the people of this country or indeed any other country uh, what they claim to be delivering. Um, and one is the dominant framework, the one we never talk about because it's dominant, the one whose name shall not be mentioned. It is the Jehovah of economics, which is neoliberalism, which is the, the, the system that governs almost every aspect of our lives. I mean, in fact, to call it an economic framework of thought is, is, is to um, suggest it's narrower than it really is because it's um, a means of describing human life and in describing it, changing it. Um, and uh, so what it says is that um, we are inherently selfish beings whose aim is to maximize our own resource holding potential to grab as much wealth and power for ourselves uh, at the expense of other people. Um, and that, that is a good thing, um, that competition is the defining characteristic of human relations and anything that interferes with that competition um, uh, creates a moral breach because it interferes with the um, sorting means by which merit is discovered and rewarded. That um, we live and should live in a system of winners and losers, and if we allow that system to proliferate, then there'll be far more wealth for all because it will reward enterprise. Well, the reality is very different. Um, we've seen a system um, which um, uh, rewards those who were halfway down the track before the race began. Um, having then got to the pot of gold before anyone else, they ensure that their children and children's children um, never have to do proper work again. And they immediately turn from being entrepreneurs, which they might, have, might not have been in the first instance, into rentiers. And so this has created a fantastically elaborate and justified system of unearned income. Um, that um, it basically describes how um, uh, the economy works in this country and almost every other. And then on the other side, you have um, the uh, sort of fight back, uh, led by some remarkable and highly intelligent, brilliant analysts, uh, people like Thomas Piketty and Joe Stiglitz and Paul Krugman and Harjun Chang, uh, for all of whom I have tremendous respect in that they... Um, comprehensively demolish the neoliberal model. And they say, what do we need instead? We need to go back to another defunct economic system, which is Keynesianism. Now, there, there are three fundamental problems with this. The first is that it's very hard to excite people about old ideas. The second is that Keynesianism, uh, well, the reason that neoliberalism is hegemonic today is that Keynesianism um, ran into the wall in the mid-1970s and the only alternative comprehensive economic framework that was around at the time was neoliberalism, which penetrated bizarrely first left-wing governments or broadly social democratic governments, Jimmy Carter's and James Callaghan's, um, and then rapidly colonised um, the, 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 the rest of the political spectrum. Um, and the third problem with Keynesianism is by far and away the biggest problem is that it relies on stimulating consumer demand in order to enhance economic growth, which in the midst of the greatest predicament of all, the, econo uh, the, the environmental crisis, is utter madness. And neither of these can deliver what they claim to deliver simply because, um, uh, well, Keynesianism was able to do so during the Trump glory years between 1945 and 1975. It did so supremely well, but globalization effectively sank it because you're stimulating consumer, I mean, very crudely, stimulating consumer demand in, in, in Britain um, means you're, 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 you're um, aiding industrialization in China. You're not actually, uh, the, the leverage no longer operates. So there's a break in, in the, um, um, uh, between, between the lever and the machine.
Um, and for all sorts of other reasons of capital finding ways of getting around the, the, the constraints. Um, so um, that did deliver, it can no longer deliver. Neoliberalism was never able to deliver for the people at the bottom of the system. It was, it was a way of, uh, it, it was a racket, a self-serving racket. It wasn't originally designed as such, but very rapidly became that way, um, which helped those who had wealth to get more wealth by extracting it from other people in the form of rent, in the form of interest payments, um, in, in, in the form of, uh, of, of toll booths by um, taking over public services and charging rent for their use. Um, and there are a whole load of ways in which we've seen a massive transfer from the poor to the rich. And, and, and that's led to two problems. One is um, the, the sense that that rising tide, which was supposed to have um, uh, raised all boats, has drowned most of them, and and people are stuck down in the mud below several fathoms of water, um, and can see no way no way of getting out of that, um, and so there's there's the immediate economic crisis. But the secondly, because it became hegemonic, and captured all parties. You know, and Labour is a classic example of this, of course. New, New Labour was a, a purely neoliberal party, Democrats as well in the United States. It, it, uh, there was no way out politically either. And so we had this system of extreme alienation where vast numbers of people could, saw that the political and economic system were no longer working for them. Um, and so what do you do but try to pull it down? You know, and the one opportunity which people have ever had to cast a meaningful vote was a vote effectively to smash the system. It was a fairly incoherent vote, but it has certainly gone some way towards smashing the system. That's true that. Um, I, do you find, I mean, the thing I noticed talking about all economics to audiences, especially young audiences, that they don't perceive themselves as living in a political system, really. Mm. They see themselves as living under an economic order. And the things they talk about are the, the kind of primary concerns are to do with just being able to pay for their lives and their expectations. Is that a, is that a direct correlation, directly caused by the, the kind of neoliberal hegemony you're talking about? Well, one of the things that neoliberalism does is to shut down political choice. It's very interesting because the whole story it tells is of freedom and choice. Mm. Um, you know, we have to we have to have more freedom, and it's very careful never to explain which freedoms it's talking about. There are some freedoms which don't detract from other people's freedoms. Say, sexual freedom or gender freedom, for instance, doesn't necessarily restrict anybody else's freedom. But the great majority of freedoms tend to be, if not zero-sum games, at least have some kind of a payoff. As Isaiah Berlin points out, uh, freedom for the pike is death to the minnow. And, and, and so the, the freedoms that um, they talk about sound great in the abstract. You have the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is a lobby group dressed up as a think tank, uh, Adam Smith Institute, there are many others which are like this, are basically corporate lobby groups um, fronting up big money but pretending to be independent think tanks. And what they do, uh, incidentally, while well, I'm on that, Institute of Economic Affairs um, has resisted all forms of tobacco regulation for many decades, only now we discover that it's been funded by British American Tobacco since 1963. <laughs> totally opaque, these people. These people are always talking about openness and freedom. Uh, no freedom of information at all about where they get their money from. Um, anyway, um, they, they're constantly going on about freedom. Freedom is all about freedom. It's all about openness. It's all about freedom. But they, they never say freedom for whom and freedom against whom, which is always the question you must ask. When anybody says, I'm for freedom, because who isn't for freedom? Say freedom for whom and freedom against whom. Because the freedom of, from trades unions, which is one of the freedoms they push all the time, is the freedom for corporations to exploit their workers, which restricts the freedom of their workers. The freedom from regulation, or red tape as they call it, is the freedom for corporations to pour pollutants into rivers, which restricts our freedom to swim in those rivers or fish in them or otherwise enjoy the, the beauty of those rivers. Um, freedom from tax is freedom from the redistribution, which is absolutely essential if those at the bottom of the system are to have, have their prospects raised and to permit social mobility to take place. So, so the freedoms that they've been promoting are um, restrictions of the freedoms of the great majority on behalf of, um, of corporate capital. 
Um, and, 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 and because this has become hegemonic, and because, as Tony Judd points out in Ill Fares the Land, it, it, it automatically restricts the scope of the state, because neoliberalism says, you know, th in this situation of competition, the state should not be involved, because the state um, um, uh, commits this moral breach by saying, we're going to interfere in this um, um, uh, decision of who is the winner and who is the loser and, and, and where merit lies and there, therefore how the rewards should be distributed. We must remove tax. We must re remove the regulatory capacity of the state. We, we must stop this interference from taking place. And in doing so, you vastly shrink the scope of the state, which is, of course, what they want, and they appoint people, effectively politicians, who, um, who, who, who will do that. The self-hating state tears itself to pieces. Um, but, um, but it also, in doing so, restrict political choice, because by voting you can change much less if the scope of the state has been restricted and the state is no longer activist. <coughs> the state can no longer make decisions which are actually going to change outcomes, which is anathema under the neoliberal approach, then there is no meaningful decision you can make by voting. And so people gradually become disenfranchised and alienated from politics. And it's very interesting that the doctrine, which was promoted under the slogans of freedom and choice, boils down to the central slogan, there is no alternative. How does that work? Is it, I mean, an odd thing I notice is that you have um, passionate and uh, fascinating and lucid critiques by people like Harjun Chang. Mm -hmm. It's a book I particularly admire, um, 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism, and, and Krugman and Stieglitz and so on. But it's easier to recommend books critical of the system yeah. than to recommend a book which explains what the system is. And equally, yeah. if, you're, if either of us were, was an economist, we would be banning each other from using the word <laughs> neoliberal. If you're ever on a yes. thing with an economist and use the word neoliberal, they immediately kick off. Yeah. It's a sort of taboo word. Yes. So there's also a, uh, there's a strange thing. It's a it's a hegemony, but it's also a kind of zone of silence. No one actually stands up in public and argues for uh, increased That's inequality right. as a means to greater prosperity. Why why is that? Well, it's in, this is almost always the case with hegemony that 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 thing which is hegemonic is that which shall not be named, uh, and that's how you maintain its power. I mean the the. The, the anonymity of neoliberalism is both a symptom and a cause of its power. Um, it's a symptom of its power in that it's so big we can no longer see it and everybody has tacitly agreed not to mention it. And if you do so, as you say, you get shot down. And, and you say, so you say to people, well, what are you then? What sort of an economist do you call yourself? Oh, I'm just an economist or I'm a classical economist or I'm a, a libertarian. And you say, well, then who were Hayek and von Mises and Friedman and the, the authors of neoliberalism. Oh, well, they were kind of classical, libertarian sort of economists. It's to suggest there was nothing novel about their proposals, whereas they're uh, highly novel. They, pre they presented themselves as being extremely novel. So it's sort of quite self-effacing in, in a weird way because you shall not mention the name. You do not say Jehovah. Um, and, 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 it, it, and that is the case with, with a, almost any hegemonic system. You, because the first step in challenging power, as the theologian Walter Wink points out, is to name it. Naming the powers is step one to doing anything about it. And until you've named it, you, you remain mute. You don't have the voice with which to challenge power because you do not have the vocabulary with which to challenge power. So they're very careful all the time not to be named and to resist fiercely any attempt to name them or indeed to identify what they're really saying. So, for instance, you know, they're always talking about the enterprise society and entrepreneurship and, and wealth creation, but, but the people who benefit from it, as I say, are primarily the rentiers. But you can't talk about unearned income. How, when did you last hear a discussion about unearned income? And yet all the... <coughs> The major streams of income now flowing through this capital are unearned, whether it's from property, whether it's from a different kind of rent, which is interest. You know, you, so people say, well, you know, it's just lending people money. Yeah, but who lends the money? The rich people lend money to the poor people, basically. That's how it works in aggregate. And interest is the rent that you extract from the lending of that money. So it's a very direct means by which money is transferred from poor people to rich people. And yet we don't see it like that. 
The banks are wealth creators. They're, not, they're wealth extractors. And, 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 and as Andrew Sayer points out in his, in his very good book, um, uh, Why We Can't Afford the Rich, um, he, 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 says, um, um, he, he says that the weirdest term of all is investment. Everyone thinks they know what investment is, but he says he points out, and it's blindingly obvious once he points it out, that it means two completely opposite things. Uh, the original um, sense of investment and how we kind of understand investment is um, using money to generate goods and services which wouldn't otherwise exist. So you might invest by building a school, for example, and the school is educating children who would not otherwise have been uh, educated. Or you might invest in a bottling plant and you're producing bottles of Coca-Cola which wouldn't otherwise exist in that region, for example. But it's now um, come to mean something completely different, which is buying into existing assets in order to milk them for rent, interest, dividends, capital gains, and the rest of it. Property, for example. Um, and so you buy a building which already exists or a share in a building which already exists and you hope to make money from that. And that's called an investment. But it's the opposite of the other kind of investment because it's not creating something new. It's just milking something which already exists and therefore reducing um, the, 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 the value because that inevitably raises prices, reducing the value for money that you get from that pre-existing asset. Um, and so you... you, you it's another term which brilliantly disguises what's really going on. We, we have to unpack these terms and start to understand them. But doing so is a radical act. But some of the, the, the damage done by the current order, it's not all external, is it? I mean, one of the themes in the book is about the states of mind that people get into in very acquisitive, very competitive societies. And you talk about the work of Belgian psychoanalyst that, who's unfamiliar to me, Paul Verheige, is that yeah. how you pronounce yeah. it? Yes, he, he, he wrote an excellent book called What About Me? Um, talking about the, the impacts of living under this system, this neoliberal system. And, and, and one of the remarkable characteristics of neoliberalism is, is its capacity for self-replication, for self-reproduction, that we absorb and reproduce its dominant creeds. So, um, uh, uh, so the rich are supremely good at telling themselves that they earned their income and they got to where they are through merit. And at ignoring, you know, we all ignore stuff and we all tell ourselves we're better than we are. You know, anyone in a shared house will know that everyone does a lion's share of the washing up. Um, but, we, um, but, but the rich you know, are very good at forgetting that they had, uh, a lot of them, a great deal of advantages in terms of education, in terms of inheritance, in terms of social networks, class, all the rest of it. Those, uh, uh, in, in, in a great deal of cases, among very many of the rich, were what gave them a leg up and it meant that they're rich while other people are poor. But they, they're very good at forgetting that and engaging, indulging in what's sometimes called the self-attribution fallacy, um, attributing to yourself the work that was done by others or that wasn't really work on your part at all. But the poor also um, absorb the, the dominant doctrine. So, and, we, and poor people start to blame themselves for their situation. And a classic example of this is, is, um, is, is, is consumer credit. Credit, as, as a word. Super debt, sorry. Debt is a word we used to, used to call it, but, but debt sounds a bit scary, so now we call it credit because we don't want to face what it is. And I just called it that. It shows how hegemonic this system is. But, um, consumer debt. When you break it down, when you look at why consumer debt keeps rising, you know, it was knocked down a bit by, the, um, by, 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 by 2007 and 2008, and it's rising and rising and rising. Yeah. All the discussion in the newspapers is, well, you know, these are feckless, irresponsible people, spending money they don't have, uh, maxing out their credit cards on huge widescreen TVs. You know, it's always the story you hear. You look at what has actually driven that, it's property prices. It's uh, rents and, and mortgages have become uh, taking up such a huge chunk of people's incomes that it's really difficult to get by month by month. And, and even when you are doing your utmost to curtail your spending and just pay, paying for the essentials, you, you are having to draw very heavily on your credit card or on other sources of debt in order um, to, um, to, to just to make ends meet. But, but we all absorb that notion. Same with unemployment. You know, nowadays, 
you know, the, the standard term for someone who's unemployed is a scrounger, a shirker, a, a wealth extractor, whatever it might be. Um, and, and people come to, to absorb that, to see themselves that way. So never mind structural unemployment. If you don't have a job, it's something morally wrong with you. Um, uh, and, and, and there's a whole load of things like this where we come, uh, people come to see themselves as losers because it's all about winners and losers. This whole system is about determining who the winners are, determining who the win losers are in this perfect competition uh, um, um, and fueled by perfect information and all these other theological um, um, inputs uh, to, to, to this uh, belief system. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and by absorbing this, people then um, become prey to all sorts of psychological distress. And, and, um, and what Vahagi shows brilliantly, in my view, um, is a very powerful connection um, to, um, um, to uh, the rise um, of uh, certain forms of depression, um, of uh, eating disorders, of self-harm, um, social phobias, and, of course, the rise of loneliness, which is one of the great epidemics of our time, almost the defining characteristic of our time. This hyper-social mammal, you know, there's no mammal more social than us, except possibly the naked mole rat. Um, and we're now, so sort of seven billion people are walking past each other and not talking to each other. This extraordinary situation, which he also sees as an emergent property of, of, of a neoliberal system. And, it, and Britain is the world capital of loneliness, isn't it? It is, and, and it's no... Well, it's a European capital European. of loneliness, and, 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 there's, and there's no surprise there because we are the European nation, if that is indeed what we still are, um, uh, with, with, where neoliberalism has gone furthest. The, the, <clears throat> one of the themes in the book, um, and I think it's really important if we think about how things might change, to, is to remember that this actually was created. It wasn't accidental and it wasn't God-given. It, was it was an ideological program and it had um, you know, thinkers and writers, and it had a mission and um, a kind of a team. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that, starting with maybe that mo the famous Mont Pelerin thing yes. you mentioned in 1947. Yes, yes, yes thank you. Um, y yes, because you know, the whole story we're told is that this is just how we are. This is just who we are. We are like this, so we operate this way, we behave this way. And, and it's fascinating, you know, because the whole story is about human selfishness, you know, about, you know, we, we are the fallen species, but we are so not like that. It, there was a wonderful um, paper in a psychology journal I read, um, which said that homo economicus, this term they give for us, is what the neoliberals, you know, they, this, this name they use for what human beings are like. It said homo economicus is a very good description of chimpanzees. It's a very bad description of human beings. Because chimpanzees, like most other mammals, you know, they get some food, they might possibly share it with a very close relative. Possibly, but there'll probably be a fight over it before it gets to that point. But if a stranger, someone who's not genetically related to them, comes along and wants some food, they're quite likely to get killed. You know, it will very quickly turn into violence. Yet human beings, we, you know, my, 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 my Dutch mother-in-law, um, her family took in a Jewish refugee boy and hid him in the attic throughout the entire German occupation. They would all have been killed. They were found that way. They'd never met this, this boy before. The first time they'd ever met him was, was when um, he was brought to them by someone saying, can, can, you save, can you save this boy? And they hid him. They could all have been killed for a stranger. There are people right now taking refugees into their homes and treating them as family members. When you go out on the streets and you try to get to the tube. Are you elbowing people out of the way, trampling the elderly in order to, 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 to get them? That's just not how we work. And, and you look at, at, at toddlers, even, um, um, even before they're truly toddlers, 14 months, um, uh, there's some really fascinating uh, psychological experiments showing how they are actually trying to help other unrelated children of, of their age. And, and, and then there's all this really interesting work showing the development of these, these moral codes as, 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 as children get older. We are this remarkably, astonishingly altruistic and empathetic species, governed by a whole lot of inveterate bastards. But, that's, <laughs> but, but, but on the whole, we, we are remarkable. You know, 1% psychopaths, sadly, many of them are in charge. But, but, but the great majority of people are really, really great 
uh, empathy and altruism and, and, and all of that. But we'd tell ourselves something different. And, of course, the news seems to confirm it. You know, we see the Paris attacks where, where you know, uh, these horrendous, horrible massacres are carried out. They were carried out by eight people. Eight, eight people did a really terrible thing. But then hundreds of thousands of people came out on the streets in solidarity to say, this must never happen again. And we don't want a war coming out of this. We don't want to go and fight people. We just want to stop this from happening. We want peace. That's who represents the great majority of humankind. But what lodges in our minds was what those eight people did. And that's what we remember. And so it seems to confirm that idea of, of this vicious bestial nature that's going to, uh, this war of all against all, as Thomas Hobbes um, um, described the state of nature. This was a man, of course, whose, whose only knowledge of human evolution came from the book of Genesis. Um, so, uh, sorry, the question, get back to the question. There's quite a, a long way idea back. That, sorry, you know, yeah, and it's a, it's been a deliberately created thing. Yes, the idea that yes. selfishness is the most That's important right. yeah. drive of human no, action, quite right. yeah. and that the only ways of mediating them are That's through right. markets. And that's that's, that's right. an idea. Deliberately, we're, we're, we're taken. We're asked to take that as a natural thing, a fact about that's the law right. of nature. That's right. And actually, that's a program and a project. Absolutely. So, so sorry, I, I, yes, I went off on a total diversion mm. there. But, but, but no, you're quite right. And so, so um, the term neoliberalism was coined at a meeting in Paris in 1938, which was attended by the two people who became the... The, the sort of original thinkers really laid out the ground, um, who were um, uh, Frederick Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, both of whom incidentally were Austrian exiles. Um, and, um, and they saw some pretty bad stuff in Austria in, in, in the following years, as you can imagine. Um, and, and they both um, uh, evidently and correctly perceived Nazism and communism as crushing the human spirit crushing individuality out in front in favor of a behemothic state um, which um, would just um, uh, uh, grind all human differences into dust in order to create one kind of person which you know, was a fair description of, of what both communism and Nazism were doing um, <clears throat> but they then took what I think was an extraordinary leap of seeing anything which was at all on the spectrum of collectivism, as they put it, as leading inexorably to the same ends. With the Road to, to Serfdom. The Road to Serfdom, exactly, which was the title of Hayek's book, uh, published in 1944. Ludwig von Mises, at about the same time, published a book called Bureaucracy. And they both saw social democracy as practiced, um, for instance, on, on the, uh, in New Deal America, or in the um, incipient development of the welfare state in Britain, they saw that as leading inexorably to totalitarianism and serfdom. Um, and and, and you know, they were quite uh, genuine in their beliefs. You know, they, they didn't start off as cynics, though it very rapidly became a cynical programme, but, but they, 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 this is what they genuinely believed. Um, it was a strange belief, but it sort of arose from trauma. You know, you could sort of see, see how it came. And, they, and both books were very successful. Um, and, and then um, quite rapidly, at the end of the um, war, they began, they began organising. And they were supremely good at this, you know, far better than the left has ever been. And there was a lot of lessons um, for people trying to create new systems in what the neoliberals did. They were very, very good at it. They quickly created uh, what the historian Daniel Stedman Jones has called a neoliberal international. Um, and, and this was a network of um, scholars and activists, uh, but then very rapidly funders uh, drawn from originally throughout the Western world and quickly became um, much of the world. Um, and, and right from the beginning, they attracted the attention of some very rich people indeed who saw in their prescriptions a great escape from democracy. Because what they were saying is, you know, we, we have to be free from trade unions. We have to be free from tax. We have to be free from regulation because all these are the road to serfdom. Well, hey, hey, who doesn't want to be free from tax, trade unions and, 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 and regulations if you're a millionaire or if you run a corporation? These are your great enemies. These are what you want to get rid of. So they began pouring money into them. And one of the first things they did was to create this network of think tanks on both sides of the Atlantic, a huge number of them. Because when it, you create the impression that there are many voices saying something, then you think, oh, well, that, 
you know, that there must be some wisdom in this if a lot of people are saying it. So they set up the Institute of Economic Affairs, the Adam Smith Institute, Center for Policy Studies, and several others on this side, the Atlantic, the Cato Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Hudson, on and on and on it goes. There's loads and loads of them. Um, and, and, and funded by some of the richest people of the time, the, the multi-millionaires of the day, um, and it's still going on. So the Koch bro brothers, David and Charles Koch, two, both of whom feature in the world's top 10 richest people, um, set up a whole number of think tanks in the US. Among them was Americans for Prosperity, which founded the Tea Party movement. It set it up. There's, there's video footage of, of, of David Koch addressing a Tea Party meeting saying, I never have imagined that our, our humble roots with the Americans for Prosperity would have led to this wonderful flowering. Congratulations, you've done exactly what I wanted you to do. And this was supposedly, just like with Donald Trump, a, a movement against the control of the billionaires and the corporations and all the rest of it. But it was started by them. Um, and this network continues to develop and proliferate in many ways. And, and, and one of the things that gives it fuel, of course, is the media. Now, the great majority of the media is owned by billionaires or multimillionaires. So, of course, um, they have the same interests as other people of their class and they, um, and, and they want those interests promoted. But most culpable of all, I believe, in this country is the BBC. You know, day after day, literally not a day goes past where one of their current affairs programs is not interviewing someone from one of these so-called think tanks without ever asking, who's funding you? On whose behalf are you speaking here? You know, if you had someone from Bell Pottinger or, or Burston Marstella or one of these other overt corporate lobbying companies um, on your program, which you wouldn't because the BBC collaborates in sort of not exposing where stuff's coming from and they don't want to talk. Um, uh, they don't want to identify themselves in that way. If you had one of them on your program, you'd say, right, so you are representing Exxon and you're saying we should take no action on climate change. And so, you yeah, fine, talk to them, but everyone would know why they're taking that position, who's paid them to take that position. You get someone from the Institute of Economic Affairs or the Adam Smith Institute or something on, on the radio or on the telly, and this literally is a daily occurrence arguing against regulation, arguing against tax, arguing against um, uh, attempts to um, cut the amount of sugar and fat in food or, or, um, to, um, um, uh, or fracking, whatever it might be, arguing in favour of fracking, absolutely. And never, never do they ask, who's funding you? Because they, you know, they, they don't, it's not so accidental that they come up with this programme which happens to be highly beneficial to corporations. It's the corporations and the very rich people who are paying them to do so. And to an extent, people don't realise that a lot of discourse on the internet is actually mm. fake, isn't it? I mean, yep. I have a number of friends who write for The Guardian, so you can always tell when the fake thing starts, because yeah. it's, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, it's when American commentators get up, and they're, they're being paid to yep. comment negatively to write negative Amazon yep. reviews. Absolutely. You know, they're responsible for all my own negative Amazon reviews. <laughs> um, and to just create this yeah. sense that there are this huge cacophony of voices all Sorry. sort of shouting the same thing, as in fact, it's an entirely confected... Yes, yes. And I, I, was, I, was, I, I, I first came across this with global warming, with, uh, you know, where there is, seemed to be this and huge... There's no of, subject more like that, yeah, is there? that's right. That's right. And there seemed to be this sort of huge number of people who just absolutely did not believe it. And, you know, I was part of some you know, new world order, global government conspiracy to tax people and all the rest of it. I thought, God, they really hate me. They really hate me. And I had sort of one of those Tony Blair moments. Uh, moments. But why do they hate me? I don't understand. <laughs> um, but but, but then, then I realised that actually, you know, I... I, I, I I've gradually begun to discover what was going on, largely because of the tobacco archives. Very interesting. Um, uh, as part of a huge tobacco class action settlement in the United States, um, the archives of the big tobacco companies were deposited at the University of California, LA, um, and, and anyone can um, get access to them through the internet. And I spent uh, months working through them. And what was absolutely extraordinary was to see how 
the whole network of what's called astroturfing, creating fake grassroots organisations and sock puppetry, um, claiming to speak for yourself when you're actually speaking for the person with, 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 with his hand up your bum. Um, uh, that this, this whole network was originally set up by the tobacco industry, but then all of them just went shoom, straight into climate change when Exxon and others came along. And Exxon and Philip Morris, were, uh, the big tobacco company, were working together uh, because they realized, what Philip Morris realized, was that if we only talk about tobacco, everyone will know who's behind it. But if we talk about a whole load of regulatory things, including food, including climate and all these things, we, uh, then, then they won't see our fingerprints. Uh, they, uh, we create a smoke screen, so to speak. And, um, and, and so they began collaborating with Exxon. Exxon then started paying the same people who had been working for the tobacco companies. And I started seeing all these names. And I thought, wait a minute, I, I, I recognize that address. And, 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 and I started looking at the websites. And, and, and you, you could see at the time, it's much harder nowadays, but uh, you, you could follow the numbers, follow the gateways. And bang, bang, bang. Yeah, the, these are the people doing it. And in fact, one of the companies, interestingly, um, which went biggest on astroturfing was Monsanto, which happens to own the patent for astroturf. <laughs> Keeping it in the family. So are, there, are there any lessons for progressive movements or the left in how to change people's minds, how to change mm. the frame of a debate, mm. how to change the climate of opinion? I mean, mm. are there things that as well, the good guys could emulate? Well, yes, thank you. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it is interesting just how utterly useless and floppy we have been. Um, uh, how reactive we, we've been on the left and centre. Um, just sort of waiting for someone to throw something really nasty at us and then we say, oh, that's really nasty and we've got to stop that nastiness. And, and it's like the Father Ted protest, like down yeah. with this sort of thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> yes, yes, down with this sort of thing. It's, it's, it's completely right. And, and we play the role of Father Ted and Father Dougal chained outside the cinema because actually we don't have an agenda of our own. We, we are reactive, we're not proactive, we, we're, we're oppositional, we're not propositional. And, and what was utterly brilliant about the neoliberals was they had a very clear agenda of their own. It was mad, but it was, they, they knew exactly what they wanted, and they then knew how to get it. And sure, it helped that they um, uh, had all that money behind them. It helped a great deal that they had all that money behind them, because they could professionalise it. They could devote thousands of people to making it happen as a full-time job. Um, and, and we don't have that, but that's partly because we haven't really got it together to sort of assemble a network of funders in a way that could have been done um, and still could be done. Um, but it's clear they had this sort of clear political and economic philosophy, and then they were highly strategic in, in getting it out there and very long-term in their thinking. Milton Friedman, you know, one of the authors of neoliberalism, sort of picked it up in the 1950s and became the sort of American Frederick Hayek, with his book Capital and Freedom, um, he, he, he said, this isn't going to happen in this generation, but in a generation's time it will. And he was dead right. It ha you know, from mid-1970s, he was talking then, early 1950s, mid-1970s, a generation later, suddenly when Keynesianism runs into big trouble, as it was bound to do eventually, there was um, a, a, a new ideology there and ready. And, and look, this is, this is how it, it happened. Um, Great Depression, um, total economic collapse, 1929. John Maynard Keynes sits down, what are we going to do about this? Comes up with his general theory, utterly brilliant. Um, its logic immediately appealed to people. Sure, he was well-placed already in the establishment, so he could roll it out there. But you could immediately see this guy's got an answer. Maybe not the answer, but he's got an answer that we can use, we can work with. And it was highly effective, and it worked extremely well for a long time. And so it became almost instantly hegemonic. You know, what was fascinating about Keynesianism, you know, as Richard Nixon said at one point, we are all Keynesians now, you know, is that, that everyone adopted it. Whatever their professed ideology was, left, right, whatever, they all became Keynesians. I'm talking about governments and opposition parties in the Western uh, nominal democracies. They all become Keynesians. Um, 
And then neoliberalism comes along. The first governments to adopt elements of the neoliberal package, as I say, were the Carter and Callaghan administrations, um, basically monetary policy and foreign exchange and stuff. Um, they adopt elements. And then um, Thatcher and Reagan come in, and the whole package instantly, wage war and trades unions, massive tax cuts, massive regulation cuts, uh, mass privatization and outsourcing, get rid of the housing stock, everything, the whole neoliberal package. But what was just extraordinary was that with just a bit of a time lag, the opposition parties adopted the whole package as well. And Labour's crisis has many roots, has many origins, many causes for Labour's crisis, but one of them was that it shut down political choice just when we needed political choice most by adopting the, um, the, the, the economic program of its opponents. And, and it adopted it because there was nothing else on the table. Keynesianism had, 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 had effectively failed, not you know, for any original fault of John Maynard Keynes. He was utterly brilliant and it worked for a long time, but then it stopped working. And no one else had produced anything since then. The left and center has produced no new general framework of economic thought for 80 years. And we wonder why we're in trouble. And, and what strikes me very strongly seeing that history is that uh, it's not new political parties or new leaders of those parties or new policies proposed by those parties which change things. It's new political and economic philosophies. It's a new normative framework of thought which changes things. And then everything changes. Nothing changes until you get one, and then everything changes when you do. So last question before I open it up. Um, do you see any sign that we're at that moment? I mean, I know there's a general sense of it can't go on like this. I think no one disagrees with that. But do you see that any evidence of that shift, that in framework? Well, the, the, old, the old has died, but the new is yet to be born. And, and so we're in this um, horrendous situation of, of stasis, if you like, where we're just waiting for the Messiah, but there ain't a Messiah on the horizon because no one's been developing one. It, just, it doesn't just emerge by itself. Um, this, the, the, this takes a lot of work. Uh, I mean, there's, I say no one. I, I, that's actually really quite unfair because people like the New Economics Foundation and the Neon Network and various independent thinkers have been coming up with all sorts of really interesting stuff. And one of my ambitions might never be realised is to sit down for several months and see if anyone's actually really cracked it, as far as I can tell. Maybe they have, but it, it hasn't been widely recognised or adopted, if indeed they have. And, and, it has, and partly because we on the left and centre are so fragmented and at odds with each other and, and have adopted the neoliberal paradigm to the extent that we're all competing with each other as opposed to working together and trying to shout each other down. We're not looking. We're not seeing. Has someone done it? And if they have, let's all get behind it and champion this thing. Uh, you know, if John Maynard Keynes was to pr produce his general theory today, um, you know, maybe there'd be an article in The Guardian about it and it'd be forgotten by tomorrow. <laughs> You know, because because we're not, you know, we, 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 we don't cooperate in that way anymore. Um, and so, you know, we, yeah, we have to determine whether, whether we have the system in theory and then we have to just really get behind it and, and, and get this rolled out because otherwise we're just going to remain oppositional. We're going to keep saying, oh, my God, Osborne's so awful and, oh, God, it's not going to be Theresa May, is it? Oh, well, as long as it's not Andrea Ledson, you know, and if just, we're just going to be completely locked into their proposals and just keep responding to their proposals. And it doesn't get you anywhere at all. The best you can do is slow retreat as opposed to rapid retreat. That's the most you're ever going to get out of a situation like that. We have to be offensive. I mean, on the offensive. <laughs> um, we, 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 have, we, we, we have to have our own clearly worked programme and a strategy for promoting it. Otherwise, we're just going to lose, lose, and keep on losing. That's why the left is in such disarray today. It doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know what it wants. It doesn't know where it's going. All it can do is fight itself, tear itself up into shreds, um, because it has no direction. Uh, you know, it's, like, it's throwing a sack full of cats into the river. You know, you, you, it can't go anywhere because it's still inside the blinking, blinking sack. 
Thank you. Well, um, <laughs> Leo from the publisher Verso asked if we could end on a positive note. Um, that says, lose, 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 a sack full of stinking cans. And a horrendous situation of endless stasis. So on that note, any questions? Um, Anna, maybe take some from Facebook. So if ghostly disembodied voices come through the ether, that's what it is. Yeah. I can vaguely, barely hear you. Yeah? Okay. No. Not that. Oh, yeah, hold it right okay. up against you. That's that. better. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, George. I uh, really enjoyed your talk, and also I'm a regular reader of your columns, sort of one of the daily doses of sanity. Um, God, I, there really I, is no hope. <laughs> I, I, but I... It's a thing that I'm sort of struggling with, and I wonder if you might be able to help me with it. One thing I know you've written about elsewhere is the perversion of language, such that, for example, the word social security has appeared and replaced by something called benefit claimants, and all that is carried by that. But also as a doctor and psychiatrist, I'm now a thing called a provider of services. And it, working in the health service, one of the curious things is with this great sort of liberal freedom rhetoric, the experience on the ground is that when the war came down in Berlin, we started to exist in a kind of peculiar kind of Stalinist state in the public services, mm. where we're ruled by uh, plans that we can't possibly fulfill, uh, signing up to documents that we can't possibly um, carry out, we have a kind of a Samizdat culture in the pub where we all laugh at it but sign the documents. And it's peculiar because our daily existence is an existence of the most terrible unfreedom. That is, we're surveyed, we're under constant surveillance. So every, you know, GPs now say to patients at the end of a consultation, uh, perhaps you could rate me on my performance. And there's something so peculiar about this because it leads to all the providers of services such as doctors and nurses and so on feeling constantly terrorized one by the targets that they can't possibly fulfill secondly by a kind of hovering super ego called the care quality commission mm -hmm. and thirdly by the spuriously empowered uh what was called the patient is now a user of services or a customer and the customer believes themselves to be empowered, so they, in turn, terrorize the professionals, uh, because they're not empowered, because they're being provided with services by people who are increasingly de-skilled, who are under targets that they need to roll the patients over as quickly as possible, uh, and they're demoralized. But I'm just curious about, on the one hand, this great ideology of freedom, and working in the public sector, the feeling of complete unfreedom, yeah. surveillance, and trapped. Well, thank you. You have perfectly and beautifully described one of the great paradoxes of neoliberalism, which is that the whole idea of neoliberalism was to uh, get rid of bureaucracy and get rid of control, get rid of state control. But in order to have a system which is defined and governed by competition, you have to have a system of assessment in order to determine who wins and who loses that competition. And to have a system of assessment, you need a system of monitoring and surveillance. And so you end up recreating, but in a different place, in a place over which we have no control, because it's no longer a democratically controlled space, you end up recreating, as you so rightly say, a sort of monstrous Soviet bureaucratic system of extreme top-down micromanagement which crushes the breath out of everyone within that system. And of course, as you know, it's, it's not just within the NHS. In fact, it's not even just within the public services. This is happening in, in private corporations as well. That where it's happening most is, is, is the recipients of Social Security who are put through such an extreme regime of quantification and monitoring that some of them give up altogether and end up at the food bank because it's just impossible to negotiate this Kafkaesque bureaucracy, which was, as Ludwig von Mises promised, the Kafkaesque bureaucracy from which neoliberalism would free us. 
And as Paul Verhage points out, it's beautiful. He says, he says we have even represent. So we've even reproduced um, the old Soviet concept of tufta, which meant um, the falsification of statistics in order to meet your targets. <laughs> We've got a Facebook question. Um, so this is from our Facebook live stream. Um, the question comes from Jimmy, who asks, what is neoliberalism's endpoint, and what does the utopia that neoliberalism is aiming for look like, in your opinion? Thank you. Um, yes, well, a uh, nice question. And I, I think the utopia that they aim for is exactly what we have today. This is, I mean, as Daniel Stedman Jones says, it is hard to think of any utopia which has been as fully realised. So you've got a hegemonic political system with no alternative. As we were promised, there is no alternative. You have an economic system which is perfectly designed to uh, massively multiply wealth um, whilst sucking what little the poor, uh, poor and the middle have into the hands of a very rich transnational class who can then squirrel it away in tax havens, pay almost no tax, subject to less and less regulation, subject to less and less in the way of collective bargaining or of, of any um, workplace engagement by trade unions. Um, and, and what it amounts to is total freedom for very, very rich people to become a new oligarchy. And we're seeing, you know, everyone's aware of Russian oligarchs. So it's very weird how the word oligarch is always preceded by the word Russian. <laughs> As if there's nowhere else where the, the, these people live. But there are, there, there, are, there are oligarchs all over the world now. There are Indian oligarchs who behave very much like the Russian oligarchs. See, um, I, I don't know if he still is, but he was until recently. The richest man on earth was a Mexican oligarch, Carlos Slim, who was just given the whole phone system. You, oh, you can have the phone system, Carlos, because you're my uncle's cousin or something. Um, uh, they, they, off you go then. Instantly becomes the richest person on earth. And the richest person, incidentally, who has ever lived on earth. There was a fascinating analysis um, showing that if you can measure wealth by the number of people you can employ at an average wage, this guy was richer, richer than Croesus, richer than Marcus Crassus, richer than anyone. And these people own slaves. This guy was still, Ricardo Slim is still richer than all of those people. And of course, there are British oligarchs who behave just the same way as the Russian oligarchs and the Indian oligarchs and the Mexican oligarchs because they were basically given public services, which they then turn into private monopolies. They put toll booths in front of them, and either the user, <laughs> the, 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 the user previously known as a patient, or um, in the case of the NHS and other parts, the government must pay a fee for the service which was previously provided by the state out of taxation. So this is about as close to the realisation of a utopia as we have ever seen. And doesn't it feel great? <laughs> um, and Sorry, what was the second half of the question? Can you remember it? Um, so, just what is it that they Yeah, well, yes. So, so yeah, we're, we're here. We're here. They did it. They and got I, there. And I, I might add, I mean, I, I think one of the... One of the things you get in societies that are very unequal, um, unequal societies have very high levels of inheritability. I mean, it's, it's really clear in the data that inequality correlates with inheriting the life chances. So you end up in a situation where, you know, baby's born, is whacked on the bum, draws in its first breath, and with that first breath draws in its life expectancy, its future educational level, its future earning level. Everything about its life circumstances are determined just in that one moment. And that end point, which is the one we are, I'm afraid, travelling towards, is basically a reinvented form of feudalism, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And, and so this is one of the great paradoxes, that the road to serfdom, which is supposed to free us from serfdom, has led to this. And again, as, as Tony Judd points out, he says that uh, you know, when you've got this impoverished state, a state whose functions have been impoverished, to, uh, the, 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 where it's no longer the provider of public services yeah. and all the rest of it. All that's left, basically, is authority and obedience. And then for the state to retain its dominant position, it has to have more authority and more obedience. And so neoliberalism is far more likely to lead to totalitarianism of one kind or another than social mm. democracy ever was. Mm. Another question. <coughs> Thank you.
make, make sure that um, we have a good gender balance. Okay, the next question has so. to be from a woman, because otherwise... Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Um, well, I, was, I just wanted to ask, if I can sort of use you as a kind of Google, <laughs> um, have there been any... Can you think of any interesting recent developments in the way that people talk about this sort of thing that makes the points that are being made more effective and have more impact on things like policy decision because your book, George, for example, is full of examples of governments taking the point, agreeing with the point, for example, that outdoor education is a good thing for children and then doing nothing about it. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing is true of the higher education mm. um, sector and Stefan Kalini's made the point a few times that mm. the points are being articulated as well as they can be. Yeah. But the very little is changing. Some things are, but I just wondered if you knew of any interesting developments or, or mm. some changes that could be made there. I mean, there have been some, there have been some really interesting treatments. One of them I'd point you to is Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, of course, which describes very beautifully um, how the neoliberals have deliberately used crisis as opportunity and have created crises in many cases in order to exploit them um, and have just hit whenever there's a crisis they can use. And we saw exactly that happen in Britain with the financial crisis. Osborne um, used it to do exactly what it always wanted to do. It was just a dream come true as far as he's concerned. And now they're using the Brexit crisis in the same way and smuggling through all sorts of things we would never, we would never agree to if they were presented to us as democratic choices, which, of course, they aren't. Um, but, and so Naomi's book has, has definitely woken people up to a really important aspect of what's going on. Uh, but, you know, it's within the sort of circles of people who read books and um, talk about politics and about ideas and stuff. And as the media has failed us so comprehensively, um, yeah, and it's not surprising that the corporate media does so. The corporate media intends to fail us. It intends to keep us stupid. It intends to keep us in a state of ignorance, just the same way as the, um, the, 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 the military hunter in Brazil once did, where it actually produced a do an internal document saying we've got to keep the people uneducated, otherwise they'll overthrow us. It, just that is, is taking place in the corporate media now. But what is staggeringly, amazingly culpable is, is the public service, uh, the public service, particularly the BBC. It's just incredible. I don't know. How, uh, how many people heard The World Tonight last night on Radio 4? Yes, thank you. The rest of you didn't miss very much. It was, it was discussing the Chilcot Report, and the panel was entirely composed of people who were up to their necks in the Iraq war, all saying how none of them were responsible, and, in fact, it was all a pretty good idea anyway. It was just staggering, quite remarkable. No voice for the victims, no voice for the dissenters, no voice even for the soldiers. I mean, it was quite amazing to, to hear that and to see how the BBC has fallen. And of course the BBC is terrified because the BBC is part of the public sector which is in the neoliberal firing line. Um, but it's no excuse for what has happened there. And you know, the business unit is now just a mouthpiece for corporate capital. There's no attempt at balance, no attempt at impartiality at all. Um, it, it's just um, tell us how brilliant your company is. And you know, if there's any controversy, it's over whether you're um, um, are providing enough value for your shareholders. You know, it's not, not whether you're destroying our chances of survival on Earth because you're completely trashing the living world, for example. Um, uh, and, 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 and so... We have a really dire situation. I, I always imagined that social media was going instantly to displace the mainstream media. I was terrified for my own job. And disastrously, that hasn't happened. Because you need a cadre of professionals, of full-time people who are actually being paid to do the job. And amateurs doing it after their ever more exhausting work are not going to be able to compete. That's the fundamental problem. Um, and and we are, just, you know, the, the media is a, as big a part of this problem as any other, and we're not going to see a major shift in understanding until we can find ways around it. Okay, I think we've got time for one last one last question. Oh, oh okay, sorry. 
Hi. Um, I was just wondering what your analysis was of the Brexit vote. Do you think that the people who voted out were responding in some kind of incohort way to a hegemony that they didn't like happening, didn't like advancing, or do you and that they, or do you think that they were blindingly misled? And I don't mean by small promises like 350 million a week to the NHS, but blindingly misled about their own interests in the sense that Brussels protects workers' rights and so forth. What went so, on? Thank you. Uh, uh, good question. Um, I, I, uh, Danny Dawling's analysis um, suggests that they, the, main, uh, the Leave voters fall into two main camps. On, on the one hand, the disappointed middle, um, people who had basically been promised the earth and didn't get it, and the EU became a, um, a, 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 an outlet for that dissatisfaction. Um, because people were constantly told your life chances are being hammered by immigration regulation, etc., etc. Um, <clears throat> so those were used as a scapegoats for um, what was basically um, the denial of uh, chances for both the middle and, and, and people at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale. And the other was the people at the bottom, um, classes D and E in the socioeconomic scale, um, who, you know, I, th I think it's hard for anyone who doesn't live in a deprived area, um, and now, you know, and of course a lot of uh, you uh, probably do, but, but, but for anyone who doesn't, to understand just what is happening in this country, just how deep that deprivation has become and how utterly alienated from the economic flows people have become. You know, these are eddies which just swirl round and round. It's very, very hard to get out of them. You know, estates with with almost no employment, and, and if there is employment, the most terrible zero hours, utterly exhausting but utterly mind-numbing um, employment, which is totally insecure. And of course, insecurity and debt are very good ways of holding people down, and very good ways of, of making it difficult for people to change, uh, uh, to, to, to exercise choice, to exercise the freedom we were all promised. And I think there's partly this massive gulf between what we're told we were going to get and what we actually get has fueled this huge dissatisfaction but you know that that also makes people very vulnerable to 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 uh, demagoguery as practiced by the corporate press um there was an interesting analysis by chris hedges in the united states talking about donald trump his supporters and he drew in hannah arendt um, and, and her observation that um, those who become drawn to fascism are not the politically active, they're the politically inactive. They're the people who just see politics as a racket because it doesn't serve them, it doesn't work for them, it doesn't offer them anything. And that the elite political discussions might as well be taking place on Mars as far as they're concerned. So one's response to that is to say, well, that's got nothing to offer me. All those political debates is all rubbish. They're all as bad as each other. They're all just talking crap over my head. Uh, it's got nothing to do with me because actually I'm not feeling any of it. I'm not getting any of the things they tell me I ought to be receiving. So it's, it's, it's their conversation, it's not mine. So you then become completely politically dispossessed, disenfranchised, um, and, and you see no solutions in political debate, in, in the idea that you can use facts to generate arguments and that um, those arguments can then resolve a political problem. That becomes a completely alien tradition to you and you're drawn instead to symbols, to slogans, um, to, to martial music, um, uh, to, to sensation. You're drawn to sensation and, and, and sensation backed by the promise that you can get even, that you can get your own back. These people who've been crushing you and dominating you and taking everything from you, you can then come out on top, which is basically Trump's promise and was Mussolini's promise and was Hitler's promise. It's the promise of fascism um, and indeed of the sort of soft fascism that Trump to me represents. Now, this was, wasn't so extreme in the United Kingdom, but um, in a situation where people are, are economically alienated and politically alienated, the instinct is always going to be to find some means of smashing the system. And the only meaningful choice which people in this country below a certain age have ever been offered 
and thus below most ages, in fact, you know, the only meaningful choice that ever been offered was that referendum. The only time where you could really make a difference with your vote, that was the time. And who can blame people for exercising that choice, for actually using that vote to make a difference, using that vote to smash the system which has let them down so badly? Was that the positive note? <laughs> <laughs> It'll have to do. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much, George. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, George is going to be signing copies of his book uh, at the end here. And apart from that, it just remains to say thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.